Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lovey, and the purpose of this video is to ask for help in finding an attorney to represent me in several matters involving Coffee County, Georgia, local government, and a slew of civil rights violations against me and so many others. First, please allow me to stress that while I will be sharing my story, there are so many other stories involving innocent people who had no one to call for help. But when a proper investigation is done into this network, prison doors will be opened. The number of victims will be predictably be shocking, I fear, even to me. The key players in these attacks have been in place for many years, and their complete lack of fear, arrogance, and boldness is unnatural and speaks volumes. This is the same circuit who refused to prosecute one of their own investigators for the murder of Ahmaud Arbery. My plea for help isn't about retaliation for what's been done to me. It's about justice. It's about accountability. And most of all, it's about the victims of this local government who weren't so blessed and didn't escape that prison sentence. I desperately need your help. Help to put a stop to this powerful network and prevent them from destroying any more innocent lives. First, let me tell you a little bit about my history. I worked as a criminal investigator and a narcotics investigator for many years until I eventually left law enforcement in 2013 after the birth of my grandchild, at which time I opened up a private investigations firm in an income tax preparation office. Coffee County was my home where my grandchild lived, where my husband and my first child were buried, where my family lived and where I owned multiple properties. I was a successful entrepreneur and a respected member of the community. My story is complicated and nearly unbelievable except for the fact that I lived it. It has many twists and turns and involves nearly every branch of Coffee County, Georgia local government. For the sake of time, I'm only going to scratch the surface as it would take me hours to tell you everything that's occurred and is still occurring. I've spent two years compiling evidence and recordings that when I look back at it, still blows my mind. I have pages and pages of documents and emails and dates to support my claims and so much more. My story begins in early 2018 when I found myself involved in a property dispute and was forced to quickly look for a home for myself and my six-year-old. In my search, I found a small lot of land on the lake in the Bay Meadows community and a Katrina cottage. I was aware that I would need to contact county code enforcement and find out if the cottage would even be allowed to be placed on the lot. And to be honest, I fully expected to be told no and went into the code enforcement office really more to just confirm what I believed as I had already found another piece of property that I was prepared to purchase if the cottage was not allowed. Imagine my surprise when I was told yes, the modular home would be allowed on that lot as it was an off-frame mod. I was so happy, finally, to be able to get my little boy and I in a home. I was already picturing us sitting on the dock fishing in the evenings while I listened as he told me about his day. We have both been through a lot and I was determined to focus on my little boy who needed more stability and more of my time. I knew that before I closed on the property or bought the cottage, I needed to ensure also that I could get a septic permit. And although I had to delay closing on the property three different occasions until the permit was issued, I was ultimately able to obtain the septic permits. It was only after I completed all of my permitting and obtained approval from these officials that I purchased both the home and the lot. I was so relieved that I was well on the way to completing our home, or so I thought. Immediately after closing, I hired a contractor and was lining things up to place the home on the property when I began receiving serious pushback from county officials. These pushbacks included special closed door meetings, changes to minimum square foot requirements, and even a county commissioner who posted on the Bay Meadows Community Forum that the county was fighting me tooth and nail and I was going over their head at the state level. Numerous obstacles that were placed in my path I knew were a complete violation of my civil rights. I pleaded with county officials that they couldn't do this because after all, they were the reason that I purchased both the home and the cottage. Ultimately, after many meetings with the county attorney and the county manager, I was told that I had no other option than to obtain approval through the Georgia Department of Community Affairs. Now please understand, when I contacted Georgia DCA, I was informed that the county manager, the county attorney, and a code enforcement officer had already contacted DCA to try to persuade them to assist the county in preventing me from getting the same approval that the county themselves stated I must have. 
DCA, however, refused to assist them and insisted I had every right to place my home on my lot. I remember specifically at one of the meetings I had with the county attorney and the county manager, the county attorney attempted to get the DCA representative to join in the meeting via telephone, and this representative said, and I quote, I will have no part of this, before he hung up the phone. The county attorney was livid. In spite of being told by DCA and others that I was being railroaded and these county officials were making me spend thousands of dollars to do something that they could do or they had already done, and after months of jumping through hoops, ultimately I was able to receive DCA approval. I truly believed that I was finally going to be able to get in my, into my home because at this point I had been able to meet all of the county's requirements and there, met the ridiculous demands. The county manager even clapped his hands and said yay when I bought the data, brought the data plate to the DCA data plate to him. I was so naive and couldn't have in my wildest dreams predicted what they would do next. To fully understand their motives, you need to understand that there are some very influential people who live in the Bay Meadows community, including the assistant prosecutor of the Waycross Judicial Circuit. This ADA, the county manager, health department officials, and dozens of others have relationships that date back decades. The ones who took part in this vicious attack are all connected to one another and to the Bay Meadows community in one way or another. When I obtained DCA approval and these officials had essentially ran out of options to stop the cottage, this prosecutor, along with sheriff's deputies, a magistrate judge, a superior court judge, clerks, and a host of county officials, unleashed a unified attack that nearly destroyed me. It started when I suddenly got a speeding ticket and I wasn't speeding. I began having run-ins with law enforcement and the officers would behave as, as if they were digging for something to get me into trouble. I couldn't understand if I had made an officer angry or what I could have done for so many of them to essentially come after me. There was one morning when I was taking my little boy to school that my brakes on my truck failed and I was forced to run up on the sidewalk to keep from running straight through a red light. I thought it was a defect with my vehicle and called a mechanic shop to come fix it. Less than an hour after it was taken in for repairs, I received a phone call from the gentleman at the repair shop, and the first thing he said was, who wants you dead? Somebody had cut not only my brake lines, but also my emergency brake. I knew that the officers who, who had been re wreaking havoc in my life and whom I had filed complaints against were responsible. Now, mind you, I did not interact aggressively with these officers or in a hateful manner. I was humble and could be heard repeatedly asking on their body camera footage what I did to make them so angry. The level of hatred that it takes to try to kill a mother and her child, what could I have possibly done? And I can be heard apologizing, saying, forgive me for whatever I've done to you. These officers, although desperately trying, had been unable to pin anything on me at this point, so they came up with an elaborate scheme that wouldn't become clear until much later. Their plan began with a magistrate judge who issued a bogus warrant for a third degree forgery which was then followed by a bench warrant for a failure to appear at an arraignment on the forgery charge. Now please note that there's evidence that this bench warrant for the failure to appear was issued the day before the hearing that they claim I missed ever took place. I learned of this bench warrant mere days after I received that data plate and I was in fact meeting with the driver who would be delivering my cottage onto my lot at Bay Meadows when I learned of it. I was still clueless as to why this was happening or how it was all connected, so after learning of this bench warrant, I immediately retained counsel, and it was only after many thwarted attempts that I was finally able to get in front of a superior court judge in an attempt to lift this bench warrant. My attorney and I were able to prove with zero doubt that I was not served notice of this arraignment hearing. The clerk even testified that she had made a mistake and mailed the notice to the complainant's address instead of my own. It was only after the prosecutor announced in open court that I had been causing problems with code enforcement and needed to be taught a lesson that I finally understood the motives behind the multitude of attacks against me that had been going on for months at this point by every facet of this local government. If you recall, this is the same prosecutor who lives in the Bay Meadows community, directly across the pond from my lot. Please note that my attorney had already spoken to the judge and the prosecutor before I ever walked in that courtroom, and they both said they didn't have a problem with dismissing this bench warrant, but I just needed to go through the motions. 
There were witnesses in the courtroom that said when my attorney went out to get me, this judge, prosecutor, and a chief deputy were all discussing what they were going to do to me, no matter what the evidence showed. It was an elaborate setup, and my attorney said to me, they all lied. Every one of them lied to me. The witnesses in the courtroom expressed their anger at this judge and prosecutor for forcing myself and my attorney to go through such a long battle when they had already decided what they were going to do before I ever walked in. So at this hearing, after the judge was shown evidence that left no doubt and in fact proved that he, along with other officials, designed this charade themselves, he ordered that I be placed in jail until the next hearing date, three weeks later. I begged, I pleaded with tears running down my face for them not to take me away from my little boy that he needed me. He had nobody else. I repeatedly told the judge that I would never knowingly miss a hearing date because I know more than most the consequences. I explained my respect for the judicial system that I had served for all those years. My attorney fought and even called the prosecutor a cruel SOB. But in spite of our desperation, these animals placed me in jail knowing full well that I was being wrongfully detained and did so for personal motives completely absent of Georgia law and knowing full well the damage that would follow. It was during my 20 days of confinement that I was sexually assaulted and placed in a hole for five days where I nearly lost my life. I spent my 42nd birthday in that hole, but broken, battered, and a shell of the woman I was before my incarceration, 20 days later, I was brought back in front of this judge who stated that if I stirred, you know, it would stink before he banished me from the county as a condition of my bond. He banished me, a mother, a business owner, a resident with deep roots within the Coffee County community, a prior law enforcement officer without a blemish, a single mom with no criminal history for an alleged forgery, a probation offense at worst. Banishment, the Supreme Court has made very clear, may not be used in this manner and would be considered cruel and unusual punishment, which in fact, it was. This judge proceeded to tell me that if I was caught across the county line at someone's deathbed or my grandson's birthday, I would be immediately placed in jail until trial. During the banishment, my business was destroyed and my properties were stolen. I was denied the ability to even attend my grandson's birthday party or my son's grave. Now let me just say, while I was trapped in this nightmare and being attacked from all different directions by my own local government, that the harshest realization for me was that there was no one to call for help. I fully expected the Calvary to come into that jail cell because after all, we live in the United States of America. This is not some third world country. You can't just place people in jail to prevent them from attending a board of health meeting about a septic permit. But no matter how many times I said they can't do this, no matter how many times I was told they can't do this, that's exactly what they did. And they said, what are you gonna do about it? While awaiting my trial on this bogus forgery and during my banishment, I filed complaints against both the magistrate judge and the superior court judge with the Judicial Qualifications Commission. Now mind you, this superior court judge had already shown me the immense power that he had to destroy my mental health, my emotional health, my business, my child's mental health, and he would still be the presiding judge as I stood trial for this third degree forgery. I then learned that he was aware of the complaint I filed against him, and he let it be known that he tasted blood, and that blood was mine. My trial began at 8 a.m. and lasted for nearly 12 hours. There were three jurors that were planted by government officials, one even being a Superior Court judge's sister, who were put in place to find me guilty. I didn't learn until later how absolutely bold and corrupt the actions of this judge and prosecutor were during my trial, because see, everyone in that courtroom, including the clerk, the DA, the judge, and the bailiffs, and more, they knew who those jurors were and what they had planned for me. The Superior Court judge even stated that morning before my trial that I would be going to prison that day for four years when the jury found me guilty, not if, but when, ladies and gentlemen. This judge and prosecutor were prepared to send me, an innocent woman, a mom, a business owner, to prison for four years on what would be a probation offense for a first offender if they were found guilty. So on August 21st, 2019, over a year and a half after my nightmare began, after nearly 12 hours in that courtroom and only a half hour of deliberation, the jurors came back and by the grace of God issued a not guilty verdict. 
Before I could even finish hugging my attorney, papers that had been prepared weeks, months earlier, and never served, although there were dozens of opportunities for them to do so, were suddenly shoved into my hand. These papers were to seize my cottage. See, these papers were there just in case I didn't go to prison as they had planned. Over a year and a half after my nightmare began, I walked out of that courtroom a free woman. See, I was no longer banished and no longer living under the threat of going to prison, but the damage that was done to my reputation, to my business, and the losses financially are astronomical. Everything I've worked for my entire life, my ability to provide for my family was stolen from me, but that isn't the worst part. Money and possessions can be replaced. The worst part is the emotional and psychological damage to both myself and my six-year-old little boy. Ladies and gentlemen, the woman that you see in front of you is not the same woman that I was before I bought that cottage. I'm unable to be in a room with the door closed, and more often than not, my front door of my home is wide open. My ability to speak without getting confused and to remain on topic without rambling is extremely difficult for me. I was informed that I suffer from PTSD, but what was amazing to me is I've buried a husband, and I've I buried my only child at the time, and yet I never suffered from these things until these two judges in this local county government got a hold of me. The impact they've had on my future and the destruction in their wake is beyond comprehension. This superior court judge and this district attorney behave with an arrogance that is palpable. The draconian rulings were completely absent of Georgia law. These two officials as well as a county commissioner, the county manager, the county attorney, code enforcement officers, and other members of the judiciary had no fear in making it very clear that they were violating my civil rights and there was nothing I could do about it. These tyrants and this king on a throne with their unimaginable power and zero fear of being held accountable have been allowed for so long to rule, not under Georgia law, but the laws created by these individuals to benefit themselves and their constituents. Unfortunately, this is not the end of my story, and my cottage still sits on that lot unfinished, permits taken, and a pending case in front of this same judge. The new director and the, the assistant director of the JQC have said to me that they know my story is true, and they will do whatever they can to help me. But their inquiries take an immense amount of time and resources because they're going up against some of the most powerful men in the state, judges. The attorney that I used in the forgery trial filed into the case after they shoved those papers in my hand at my trial to seize my cottage. He did so very reluctantly and only after explaining his fear of these individuals, and with good reason. Since he filed into the case, everything has been pretty quiet, and I've continuously worked on this case, but I've been afraid that I'm not capable of conveying everything that's happened in a manner that can be understood. Again, I am not the person that I was before and the trauma I've experienced has created an anxiety and a truly profound feeling of hopelessness. Although my forgery attorney has pushed me to retain counsel in the cottage case and has said a civil rights attorney would have a field day with my story, he's ultimately forcing me to find someone immediately as he's filed a motion to withdraw, a motion that I oppose for fear of being left unrepresented and at the mercy of these officials who've already inflicted so much pain and suffering. Now, even though this same judge has recused himself from a grandparent's custody case I'm involved in, he's not recused himself from this cottage case. If I don't find counsel to represent me by March 15th, I will be at the mercy of this judge again. And believe me when I say he has no mercy. I want to fight this county, fight to prevent them from doing to anyone else what they've done to me and countless others. The stories I've heard are mind-blowing and heartbreaking. I want to go after them for malicious prosecution and a host of other civil rights violations, but at this point, I have to simply keep them from taking my home. The latest issue has been a septic permit because of an unreported well. However, I was able to obtain enough documentation that a letter would probably back them off because they have no grounds. But I need an attorney who is not afraid to fight this corrupt county to represent me. I've met a writer who's asked to write my story. I've even spoken to a reporter, but I've not moved forward with the media for fear of messing up something with this legal case until now. I will not stop pushing forward until this local government, who's been violating the civil rights of its citizens for decades, is finally stopped and prevented from wrongfully persecuting innocent people for personal gain. Until a proper investigation is done and the prison doors are opened, until these monsters are held accountable, 
please understand these individuals were willing to not only take my life and my child's life if they couldn't do that they were willing to send me to prison for four years because of a house a, a house sticks they must be stopped but I can't do it alone and they know it thank you for your time and I'm sorry I apologize I know I'm rambling and trust me it gets worse God bless.